should be recording. We are yeah. scheduling. So I just about sure to receive an email. Yeah. On February 26th. I got you. Uh, 7.30, typical breakfast. Um, we are having a special meeting for members and their guests. The meeting will feature uh, Dr. Michael Johnson, the new president of John Carroll University, uh, Dean Alan, uh, Al Mikiak, the dean of the Bowler College of Business, got that right that time, and Don Winkle, who is the uh, Muldoon Chair, Muldoon Director, and Kale Chair of Entrepreneurship here at John Carroll. And we're going to discuss the EA, how we're going to continue to pivot and get even a much stronger connection between this organization and John Carroll University and talk about some of the very exciting plans that we have here at John Carroll that we very much hope uh, you all will be very involved in. So we're going to ask you to attend and also if you would bring guests who might be interested in the association. And I think it's going to be you know, a very exciting time for us. The EA is doing well right now and I think it's going to do after this pivot even better. So as I say, the email will be going on very shortly. Uh, this is a special meeting. We're still having our normal February meeting, which uh, Rob will talk about in a second. Uh, at this point, where are you? There you are, Rob. Uh, I'd like to introduce Rob Felber, co-chair of the programming committee. He worked very hard, and Pete Martin ran into a problem. He was not speak, and we had to, you know, change speakers, and Rob was very good and got us a speaker. So he's going to make a couple of announcements, introduce our speaker, and we'll get going. Uh, plenty of food left, plenty of coffee left. Make yourself at home. Thank you, Tom. You know, we had a, a word for this past storm. Anybody know what it was? Cold. We used to just call it winter. I don't know why they got to keep naming it, but uh, uh, thanks for coming today. Uh, before we get to our speaker, um, does anybody remember opening speaker Jeff Stamp? Well, Jeff Stamp did not know that our February 20th speaker was in the audience and he's looking at our speaker list and said, I met Jack Rikushio, you know, 15 years ago, he's a great guy, he's going to speak about some really good things around, you know, brainstorming and such and why it doesn't work. And then he realized as he came down to the next table that Jack was actually in attendance. So that's, that's an endorsement for our February 20th speaker, Jack Rikushio, who's written about 22, 23 books. I've known him for about 25 years. I think you're really going to... Um, Appreciate he's a 19, what, 67 grad, I think, from, from John Carroll in, in psychology. So one of your own, uh, why brainstorming doesn't work, and two simple and powerful alternatives. So mark your calendar for the 20th. So you didn't come here to hear me, so I'm gonna jump right into our, our guest, Shane Bigelow, CEO of Onum, is a Cleveland-based company that helps government become more efficient by converting paper-based processes. I'm talking about Shane. That's okay. Shane? Yes. Yeah. I wrote it. <laughs> no, we're, no, no, oh no, no. Working with government and converting paper-based processes to digital formats using blockchain, which we're gonna hear about today. Prior to this, he was a senior VP and managing director at Bernstein, where he managed a uh, part of the firm's US business that sat and sat on the firm's responsible investment committee that focused on the United Nations principles and responsible investment, environmental, social, and government issues, and socially responsible investment matters. That's where blockchain comes in, because here is where he developed a highly informed view of blockchain technologies and how they can help society through reducing the cost of government. He's also was a global financial products manager at Cisco Systems Capital, and he also was an entrepreneur himself, having a software company in California, which he sold, in 2002. Locally, he is a member of the board of Blue Coats, the Northeast Ohio Foundation for Patriotism, the Jesu School Endowment Fund right around the corner where he is president, and the Lincoln Hall Foundation where he is the chairman of the investment committee. He has additionally been involved in United Way. This is about 10% of his bio, so I'm going to stop there. Where did he go to college? It was on there. What's three, 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 three
I edited that because you didn't want to hear it. Notre Dame, right? Yeah, another Catholic school. Yeah. <laughs> so you read the bio. You already do. Why are you shouting? I know this guy. All right, someone, someone show dice the door. All right. <laughs> Welcome, Shane Bigelow. So just to start off, um, this is what I plan to do. Uh, I thought I'd go through blockchain, kind of what it is, get level set a little bit on it, and then maybe we'll talk through some of your industries. So I'll take some examples from the audience, tell you about what I've seen in the blockchain space, how it might relate, um, what you know, kind of what we're seeing around the corner in a, in a variety of industries. So perhaps it gets the brain juices flowing a little bit, and uh, you can think how it relate to what you're doing. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about Blockland and then open it up to questions, but we can make it as interactive as we like along the way. So just to start, um, who knows uh, nothing about blockchain? Okay, all right. Um, who know, who is, knows a reasonable amount and maybe has uh, looked at it for their business in some way? Okay. And does anybody partake in blockchain directly? Cryptocurrency, you use it, you... Um, Okay, great. That table. Uh, well, Ralph, you, you get get on get on board there. You got a great table. Um, all right. So uh, the the short story on blockchain is, and this is Cisco's definition. Uh, I'll just read it because it's actually quite good. There's no point in, in remaking the wheel. Blockchain technology enables multiple parties to reach an agreement on the authenticity of a transaction in a decentralized manner, and these outcomes are then permanently recorded across a shared database known as blockchain, which is cryptographically secure. Now, if you don't know anything about tech, that sounds like um, and it makes no logical sense. Um, so let me try to use something that we're probably all familiar with, which is a ledger. You know, if you keep track of stuff, whether it's your checkbook or you know your bank account or your business books, um, there's a ledger somewhere that keeps track of everything that you uh, that you do. You know, money in, money out, that kind of thing. So the reason that you keep a copy of it. Um, is that you need to look at it. And the reason you keep a backup copy of it is that you need to make sure that the first one, if it burns up in a fire, you have another version of it. Well, imagine if you could keep a thousand copies all over the country to make absolutely sure that you never lost your ledger. And then imagine if every time you made a change to one of them, all the others changed as well. And if someone else besides you wanted to get in and change that ledger, they'd have to convince all thousand of those places that they're a legitimate entity to be able to do that. They have the right permissions to be able to do that. That's the cryptographically secured part. And so blockchain distributes the ledger, moves all the recording of things all over the place, multiple computers all over the world, and for a change to be made, and it's really not a change, it's an amendment that can never really change a blockchain. Um, it just gets amended, it gets added to. For any of that addition to be made, you need to have the right permission. So 51% of all the computers on the network have to agree that your change is legitimate. So to, to mention the security behind it, uh, we spoke to NASA not too long ago, 
And um, they are probably, besides the NSA, at the forefront of what's called quantum computing. Quantum computing is the next version of supercomputing. It basically can crack any of our current cryptography. Um, uh, <laughs> they did. Um, so uh, NASA is at a place where even they uh, do not believe that. Um, let's see. Full screen. There we go. Um, even they are at a point where they believe that um, you cannot uh, presume that quantum computing will be at enough possible power in the next 10 to 15 years to ever hack a blockchain. So if you, um, if you take that forward a little bit, let's say at some point somebody does advance quantum computing, and let's say they figure it out tomorrow, what will happen is a thing called quantum blockchain. So basically you take blockchain and distribute it with quantum computers, therefore keeping the cryptography really, really, really high. Um, let me stop for a minute, because sometimes this part in and of itself confuses people. And I will tell you that it is much less about what blockchain is and a lot more about what it does, which is on the right side of the screen. But let me just stop and see if there are questions about what it is. I am not that good of a speaker. <laughs> okay, well, I'll just keep going and then maybe you'll feel the, the urge to ask a question. So what it does is it creates trust, transparency, simplicity, and security. So the security we, we sort of touched on before, but let's talk about trust. So take uh, our company, so Onum builds products that takes paper-based paper problems in the government that cost the government money, digitizes them, and then records the, the, records the digital asset to the blockchain. So our first product is around car titles. So you take a car title, there are seven different parties that are involved to create a car title. By the way, the state of Ohio loses $300 million a year on car titles. 50 out of 50 states lose money on car titles. Think if you ran your business this way. They set the price for what it costs, you have to buy it, and they still manage to lose money. <laughs> this is true in 50 out of 50 states. Um, but car titles, you've got the dealer, you've got the consumer, you've got the manufacturer, uh, you've got, let's see, the bank, if you're borrowing money, you've got the insurance company, you've got the BMV, and you've got the clerk of courts, which you may or may not have know exactly part of that process. So those seven entities, 60 years ago when this process was defined, it made perfect sense to do it in paper. It is not the government's fault that it, that it ended this way. Um, 60 years ago, you could have a nice person take a reasonable you know, minimum wage type paying job, and when the paper came in from these seven entities, they could look at all the paper and say, eh, this one matches this one, okay. This one matches this one, great. All seven of these are okay, great. Here's your title, sir, thank you very much. Here's your title, ma'am, thank you very much. But the problem is that minimum wage earner kept making more and more and more. Inflation kept pushing it up. Pensions kept going up. Real estate kept getting more expensive. And they never introduced computing power. So we all know that if you want to compare two documents, if you want to compare two Word documents, compare track changes. Boop, pretty easy. So the computing power that you wanted to use to compare multiple documents from multiple sources, also not the hardest thing in the world. The problem is, all of those entities still rely on the government to do it because they trust that the government won't lie to them that the other six parties in their transaction don't have something different than what they have. So they rely on the paper. Well, blockchain <coughs> introduces trust because if each of those parties has a channel into the blockchain and all of them agree digitally that all of their data is the same, that you know, the lender says yes, um, what's your name, sir? Dennis. Dennis, that Dennis uh, bought this um, McLaren for 600000 I think you look like a McLaren guy. Um, bought a nice plate. Hold on, Bernie doesn't sell McLarens. Um, Mercedes. Uh, uh, so uh, I think what it is is the battery. Um, so uh, bought, this, bought this McLaren, and it's his, and um, uh, it's the right, right dollar amount, and we know where he lives, and this is his name, his social security number. Okay, great. This is his loan. We're okay with it. Same with the insurance company, same with everybody else. If all seven of those parties agree, then that's what's called a smart contract. So you might have heard that term out there before. So previously, you needed a person. If it's a really sophisticated transaction, like a real estate transaction, you needed a lawyer. And now you don't. Now everyone can directly hit into the blockchain, 
The blockchain has the code attached to it that allows for it to say, all of these parties agree digitally, like that. You've got yourself a title. Almost zero cost to the state to be able to do that. Certainly not losing money. So that's the trust side. The transparency is that let's say you're a bank and you're processing a thousand of these a day, your key bank, and you're doing loans all over the place. Um, well, they don't have the time to make sure in that given day that absolutely every transaction occurred perfectly. There's somebody's going to audit it, right? <coughs> somebody's going to come in and audit their books. Great thing about blockchain is that it's completely transparent. You can access it and see all of the digital records. Now you may ask yourself, oh wow, okay, I don't know if I want everyone to be able to see everything. So this is where I have to pause for a moment and explain that there are two versions of blockchain. There is what's called a public version, and then there's a private version. So the public version is what you see with cryptocurrency. And the reason that it's public is that when everyone trades their currency back and forth, they want to be able to know that the entity that they got it from is the entity that's giving it to them. So they want to be able to make sure that that transaction is public. And the ethos or the sort of ecosystem of blockchain is that anyone should be able to audit anybody else's movement of currency so that it's transparent. <coughs> so that stuff occurs on a public blockchain. There are lots of other reasons why you might use a public blockchain, um, but a lot of enterprise and a lot of government wants to use private blockchain for what probably already, I hope, is a logical reason. Key Bank doesn't want Huntington to be able to see all of the loans they're giving. And maybe an easier example is insurance. Um, and I know this because they told us, Progressive definitely doesn't want Nationwide to know where they're issuing policies. Because if they know where they're issuing policies, they know when those policies will expire, and then Nationwide will buy every billboard in that town and say, come over to Nationwide on this day, this year, at this time and they'll get their market share. So private blockchains have to be deployed through, and, and people use channels to access them so that they have private channels in and out and they can only see and audit their part. So you get the trust, you get the transparency, the simplicity goes back to the smart contract idea that there's less middlemen. Uh, being a former Wall Street guy, uh, I made a living kind of being in the middle. And so um, that's a little sad. But the reality is it's expensive. Um, and so middlemen ultimately are reduced in a more prolific blockchain driven world. Uh, less lawyers, less auditors, uh, a lot of other middlemen that you can probably imagine go away. And the security has, has, goes back to that initial point about cryptography. So again, let me stop and see what questions there might be at this stage. I do have one. Yes. Regarding real estate, titles to houses and things like that are public records. You know, you go on the internet and you know the address and find out who owns the property. Uh, how does that square with private Because you mentioned the bank doesn't want certain people to know that if I owe the bank, say, $100,000 on my house, that's part of the public record because they don't need that to play. So, um, so let's take uh, two different states. So I used to live in New York. And in New York, um, there's a system called ACRIS, which is a single database system that stores um, all real estate records, like what you're talking about here. Um, each county uses their tax commission or their auditor to control that and display it. Um, so in New York, uh, if you knew that address, you could not only figure out uh, who owned the place, um, you could see a, a version of their signature. Yeah. Anybody freak out about that a little bit? I, it bothers me. Um, you could see who their lender was. You could see the date they took out their mortgage. You could see the amount that the mortgage was for. And in some cases, if there was late or delinquency, you could actually see how far they've paid it down. Now this was like, whew, the first time I looked, looked myself up on this because I needed to pay my taxes, I was like, oh my good lord, why is all this stuff out there? Ohio's a little bit less, right? They, they tell you who owns it, and maybe they tell you uh, if, they're, if you were late or if there's a lien, you didn't pay your taxes or something like that. Um, but it doesn't give you so, sort of that, that same level of detail. Those are two single database systems. So they are keeping track of information that was given to them by outside entities, whether it be banks or, 
auditors, tax, uh, the tax commission, what have you, and they are storing it. Now, if you hack that database and change something, all it does is change what you or I might see in that record. It doesn't necessarily change the under whether or not you owe the bank that hundred thousand dollars. The bank still has their record, and they they're going to come collecting. Um, what blockchain would enable in a public world is that you could take those same that same public data, put it on the blockchain, and make it just as available. If New York wants to be fully exposed as they are, they can do it their way. If Ohio wants to be less so, they can do it their way. But on on the private level, what you'd be able to do is that if you had a private blockchain, that bank could say um, the moment that you make that last payment on the hundred thousand it triggers a smart contract that would send you, um, you know, a, uh, probably an email of some sort that says you're fully paid, um, now you have to start paying the taxes on your own because you're not gonna ask for a if you happen to do that or what have you. And it would kick in a process that would then shift you from paying the bank and probably alert your bank so that the payments automatically stop and you don't have to hit a button. Because the smart contract that you outset at the beginning of the mortgage or you could change along the way might say, you know, I, Shane Bigelow, will pay $2,500 a month to uh, USAA for my mortgage, and um, when I make my 360th payment, I'm doing the math right, um, I fully own that home, title gets changed into my name, um, uh, any lien is released, and the bank, my bank is alerted that I no longer need to withdraw funds, and those funds for taxes can either be escrowed somewhere else or paid directly to the state, and I did nothing because the, the blockchain would record that smart contract at the outset and enable all of those things to occur automatically so that you no longer have to go through the machinations that you normally have to go through. I don't know if that answers your question directly enough, but that's basically the two differences. Oh yeah, 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 public records don't go away. I mean, the, government can, the government can put out there whatever we as citizens vote and, and determine that they should be able to do. Um, and if we don't like it, we can change what we vote for. Uh, but that's that's up to the government. What else? Yes. Um, private private uh, blockchains. Um, uh, and there are many instances where uh, companies from different blockchains want to do transaction with themselves, or even supply chains want to do transaction. They are different blockchains. So does it mean that you have to operate multiple private networks or private Yes, it's a great it's a great question. So, um, uh, think of it. Sure. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, he, he said uh, if uh, it takes supply chain and multiple companies are on or are part of the same supply chain and they want to do business together, but they all have their own blockchain, um, how can they coordinate, communicate, do business together on? In, in, one, in one way or the other when they all have their own blockchains going on. Um, the analogy I would use is, uh, go back to like uh, 1995, 1998. Um, uh, you might have had AOL, I might have had Earthlink. Uh, it was both email. Even though we were using different systems, we could send each other an email and it would work, right? Um, the blockchain would work the same way. Basically, the, from a technical perspective, what you actually be, need to do is probably to create a third blockchain in the middle that says, um, okay, and this is why, why, why people on private blockchains will sometimes use a public blockchain for this purpose. They'll say, well, um, I'm BMW and you're um, uh, Pirelli, right, the tires. Um, so, uh, I need, when I make a car, I need to make sure that the inventory that of the four tires that I just put on that new car are replaced in the back to have four new tires for the old car, so that's a version of a smart contract. Well, block, BMW may not want all their data on their private blockchain communicating with all of Pirelli's, so what they'll do is they'll send a message to another <coughs> blockchain, probably the public, <coughs> indicating, okay, um, we just had this event occur on our, on our blockchain or our system control, and now you need to have this occur on your side, and um, that would then be a third blockchain that would be public, probably Ethereum is the most common to be used for that. Uh, that's a big company based out of New York. Uh, Joe Lubin was a speaker at the conference that we did a few months ago. And that, that blockchain would then basically send a message to their blockchains <coughs> kicking off their internal supply chain issues. So that's effectively how it gets done. And that's how it gets done without middlemen. That's how it gets done without a contract. There's 
and that's how there's an auditable record. So if Pirelli says, hey BMW, you didn't place an order for four more tires, they're like, no, 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 here you go. It's right here in the blockchain. It's like putting a PO in front of someone and saying, no, I sent you this. Oh, well, I didn't get the email. I didn't get the facts. Well, those excuses go away. My dog ate it. Nope, sorry. It's on a public blockchain distributed all over the world. There are thousands of copies of it. It doesn't break, it doesn't go down, it can't be hacked. It says right here, Pirelli, that you owe us four tires. And in our inventory, we have an internet of things going on, and um, when the, your tires come in off your trucks, that little RFID scanner on the back of your trucks, it tells us um, how many tires came off your truck, and you had 96 tires come off and not 100. So you owe us four tires. That would be, that would be an example of how blockchain would be used to impact supply chain. But, but this uh, company does not have to go that third blockchain. That's correct. It's like it's it's like um, uh, it's the it's the it's the equivalent of sending sending some a copy of your PO. Yes, uh, and to that third that third blockchain that's probably public. It's just a system communicating. Yeah. Yes. So at the bottom of this, what's the difference between this and integrated databases? including NoSQL and Relation, other than the shared coding for reporting, query, et cetera? Yeah, it's a great question because a lot of times, um, uh, and we use this decision tree in our business to determine when we want to approach um, a new problem and see if we can solve it, the first question we often ask is, does it require blockchain? Something that <coughs> don't, right? You don't need blockchain to control your attendee list for today. It's, it's not super private, not sure we need to spend a lot of time on it, paper works just fine, Excel is even better, it's okay. Um, but the reason why you might deploy blockchain is if you are lacking one of these four things in your current process. So uh, singular databases, there's a theory uh, in technology that there isn't a database in the world that hasn't been hacked that literally every database in the world has been hacked in some way. That doesn't mean the data's been used maliciously. Could have been an employee who accidentally had access, that's considered a hack. It could have been someone did try to get the data and use it maliciously. Um, could have been lots of things, but in theory, every database in the world has somehow been penetrated. You can't do that with blockchain because of the cryptography being at the level that it's at. So um, let's say uh, a big, uh, one big example uh, was uh, Maersk and IBM uh, and Walmart came together really through Walmart's driving it to make sure that as the shipping containers came off of Maersk's ships that um, IBM built a blockchain that was enabling sort of this Pirelli BMW example I was explaining, but for Walmart, so much larger quantities. Um, to make sure that all the information was, uh, all, the, all the proper products were actually finding their way to Walmart and there was no seepage. They used to do that with a traditional database. The reason they went to blockchain is they didn't trust each other. I don't know if anybody's ever done business with Walmart, they don't trust anybody. And so um, they, by their nature, didn't trust that Maersk wasn't skimming some stuff or had some shipping people that were taking stuff or whatever the case might be. So they said, okay, we'll just track it and instead of you telling us in our database with an entry that something was there, which could have been hacked or someone could have maliciously entered something and said, oh, I don't know where that pallet went or whatever. Now, through Internet of Things linking into the blockchain, you have a very good re track record of what occurred and a completely auditable and immutable record that they know can be hacked. So that, that's why they went down that path. And that's, that's one reason why someone might introduce blockchain. For them, it was to gather trust and transparency. It probably wasn't simplicity. They probably didn't pick up a ton of simplicity in that case, because they had a system that worked. Theoretically, they just thought the seepage, uh, the math they did was the seepage they anticipated was less than the cost of the project to build the blockchain solution. Ergo, build a blockchain solution, seepage goes away, in theory, and now we've got cost savings. Shane, thank you. Um, understanding that you can't change it, you can just amend it. More curious on your opinion, GDPR, privacy. I, 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 Europe is telling me anytime I want my information back, it's out, it's clear, it's off our database. How does that, does that just run in conflict with blockchain? Is that a problem to be 
still be solved? Um, well, so it's a problem if someone's using a public blockchain under GDPR rules, right? So, um, or California. Um, so, um, so uh, and I lived there for five years, uh, and I promptly moved back to the East Coast. Um, so, uh, you know, it is a problem it, when, um, let's say a company has decided to get, you know, whiz-bang brilliant and use blockchain to solve some of their problems. but Instead of building a private blockchain, which costs more money and would be GDPR compliant, they decided to use public because the theory was, well, there's so many computers, it's much better, it's much more secure, which is true. Public blockchains are, in fact, more secure than private blockchains. Um, and the logic is that, uh, so Bitcoin, for example, is a blockchain. It's also a cryptocurrency, so the two terms are the same. It's worth noting that they're interchangeable. Bitcoin's actually never been hacked. Now, some of you might quickly Google and be like, no, 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 I heard that it was hacked. It was definitely hacked. Um, that actually didn't occur. The blockchain itself was not hacked. What happened was people were storing some of their cryptocurrency off of the blockchain in a private system that was hacked and their currency was taken. Well, okay. I mean, that's kind of why you should keep it on the blockchain because it wouldn't have been hacked. You decided you needed that control, so you moved it over here on your little server, and then somebody got in there and stole $63 million, which is what they stole. Um, so I don't, I don't know who to blame there. It's not the blockchain's fault. Um, the blockchain provided an opportunity to have it completely secure. So um, the argument that uh, people will use for saying, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put it on a public blockchain is in fact the security because it's so hard to get 51% of the computers to disagree with a valid transaction and and, and, there, and thereby, you know, commit a fraud. The problem is, you violate GDPR in Europe or again California. So people went to private. So if you use private, now you've got to really soup it up. Now you've got to make sure that you protect it, because if someone could get in and amend the blockchain while it would be transparent and you'd notice it, um, it may be hard to track. So that's why big companies like IBM, Cisco. KPMG and others are building out the business units to be able to go to enterprise and say, it would be great if you could use Ethereum or Bitcoin or one of these other ones, but you're not compliant, so we have to build you your own. And um, that's where they make a lot of money. So. All right, uh, so broadly speaking, um, here are some questions that might, uh, like, again, get the brain juices going around whether or not you might be impacted by blockchain. Now, I would, I would make the argument, um, because uh, you know, it's totally self-serving, I should make the argument that everyone will be impacted by blockchain. Um, but the reality is probably not everyone will be impacted the same way. So uh, I'm curious about your industries, but ask the four, questions, four best following questions to yourself. Is there a lot of paper? If there is blockchain, there are blockchain solutions that are probably trying to solve it. Um, POs, track records, titles, anything like that. Um, do multiple parties have to come together? That happens in most places, provenance. That matters quite a bit. Um, so let's take an example of, uh, uh, well, let's take wine. Um, so uh, if I had a, uh, uh, let's say, a, mm, like a, 1952 Mouton Austrian Bordeaux, right? This is probably worth 15 grand, 20 grand, I don't know, something like that. Um, I would definitely want to know when I bought it that that was the real thing, that it wasn't just some dude with a really cool laser printer and some aging technology to <laughs> slap it on a bottle of booze. Um, because I'm not going to open it, right? I'm not going to drink that. I'm going to sell it again, try to make money. So I need to make sure that the provenance is really, really good. Well, it's hard to go backwards and prove provenance. Um, it's a lot easier if you're building an asset that you know provenance is important for to build it going forward. Well, go back to something that's totally transparent and trackable. That's perfect for blockchain. So wine manufacturers all over the world are very fast adopters of blockchain. Right from here's where the grapes came from, here's how we can prove it, 
here's how, here's the track record of where the grapes came from, here's when we bottled it, here's when we aged it, here's what we know it's ours, here's the RFID, here's the lot number, here's the bin number, here's the tracking, here's the ship it was on, here's how it got to your store, here's how the distributor took it, here's how it got to your, your house. And by the way, we paid taxes correctly all along the way, we didn't violate any interstate commerce rules, all the problems that liquor and wine people, the manufacturers have today, immediately wine was like, <sighs> Let's get in on this because they have a provenance issue for sure. But if you have a provenance issue in your industry, take 3D printers. Uh, the, the, the 3D printing companies, they need specific polymers in order to make sure that um, their product, that the output is, is exactly what the spec was that was delivered to them. And if it's not, you're making a jet engine part for Boeing to replace something that broke, and you're a 3D printer and you don't know the provenance of your polymers, you're A, probably not going to get hired by, by Boeing, and B, if you do get hired and then it breaks and you can't prove that you had the right provenance, you are out of business in a hurry. So that enterprise very quickly is moving to blockchain as well to be able to track, like Poly1 and others like this idea of tracking the provenance. Um, and then the last one is, is, are there a lot of intermediaries? Right? Is there someone in the middle that you know doesn't necessarily need to be there for the transaction to get better? And if they were removed, would it cost? Would it save time and money? If we've all had those transactions, um, but if that's it, then that that would be the case for blockchain. Yes. Is provenance a fancy word for lot traceability? Uh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Is provenance a fancy word for lot traceability? Yes. <laughs> it's the history of something. Yes. Can we talk about your car title? Um, where where will that happen? How far down the road will it take for this to be a reality? And where are you in the... How much? What did I, what did I say? Give me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So where are you in the timeline? You know, can you give us some basic steps that yeah. need, to be, need to occur in order to get there? Mm -hmm. And what are your hurdles? And when do you think you'll be able to accomplish it? Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, we hope that the product is in motion with a handful of states by the middle of the second quarter um, of this year. So uh, the primary thing you need to occur, uh, first we needed you know, elections to be completed um, in a variety of different states. Uh, this is a state, you know, titles are generally run by the state. Um, and so then they need to issue an RFP, then we need to compete for it, we need to win it, and then uh, we need to deploy it. So our product is, uh, basically complete, you, you never, when you're selling to the government, you, probably many of you do, um, nothing's ever completed fully because they don't tell you how to connect into their system until you win. So you sort of build a 95% product and then once you win, they're like, oh, and here are the keys to the kingdom for how you connect to all of our data with your system. Um, so we hope and our plan, we're rolling it out with new cars only, again, to the point that we can't prove a, a historical title, right? We can't prove that someone didn't buy a salvaged car from Katrina or something like that. But we know when it comes off the line at an OEM that it came off the ship, um, it was brought into the country, it was sold to a dealer, the dealer sold it to a consumer, and so on and so forth. So we can prove that, uh, we can track that, and um, you know, hopefully in the next few months. So it's, uh, um, mo uh, the, the, what's interesting about this relative to uh, my first company, the first company I was calling everybody and trying to get them to buy our stuff. Um, the second company, um, uh, we had about 10% of people were calling us and 90% was uh, us calling them. Uh, this one, it's the other way around. Uh, with the phone rings and people are like, hey, can you do this? And sometimes we can and sometimes we can't. But with this particular product, um, we're about uh, 15 or so states that are really pushing the envelope. Ohio is probably sixth or seventh in the country for pushing the envelope on, on using blockchain, which is awesome. This should be massive savings to us as taxpayers. We've got a little bit of a budget problem in this state. If you haven't read the paper lately, they have to figure out how to solve it. So if they can get savings this way, this is, this is a good step forward. Um, and so um, we hope that those states continue to adopt these products. So we've got car titles is one, birth and death certificates is another. Tracking of tax credits is a third. Um, these are all, uh, I, I won't, I'll share a funny story. One state called us, uh, let, I won't share their name, um, and they said, can you guys track tax credits with your program? We're like, well, yeah, 
we sure, why? I said, well, we got more applications in than tax credits we issued. I said, well, that's not a blockchain problem. You, you've got a fraud problem. Um, you know, just look at the applications, figure out which one's fraudulent, hire an investigator, you know, you'll solve your problem. I said, no, 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 you don't understand. We did, everything was filled out perfectly. So let's say your company, you buy solar panels and you put them on your roof and you get a $100,000 tax credit. Then the tax credit, um, uh, you, you show a loss that year, so you sell the tax credit to a broker. And the broker buys it from you for $80,000 to so resell it to somebody else for $90,000 so they can capture the last $10,000 of benefit. Well, that broker may or may not have, again, middleman, that broker may or may not have sold it two, three, four, five times. And if you and I sit down after this meeting and fill out the forms correctly and hand it into the state, most states look at it and they're like, yeah, that's right, yeah, he should get the credit. You may never have bought it. So this fraud is rampant across government, and the uh, and the idea is that you know you should be able to track this. This gets back to this is a perfect application for blockchain. Um, so this is a this is what's occurring right now. People are looking at their problems and saying, how do I solve it? Does it do I have these issues? Is there a better way to keep track of things? All right. So this I stole this from KPMG. Um, the, these are uh, I don't know. If, is anybody in these industries? Because this will be interesting if they are. Aerospace, pharma, tech, consumer products, life sciences, telecom. Few people. Okay. What the hell is everybody else doing? <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> more important things. Probably making a lot more money than making blockchain. Um, so uh, these are some examples. Um, I think what's what, you know we talked a little bit about supply chain. Um, uh, IOT with the uh, Walmart example or the Pirelli BMW example. Um, product transparency is neat. Um, there's a local company that did something that's really cool around blockchain and maybe gives another practical example. Uh, so turns out there are 17 types of eggs. Um, now I didn't know this prior to taking that particular meeting and I will say that um, learning about blockchain in the last few years I have taken some very odd meetings. Uh, the one where I learned that there were 17 different types of eggs is you know, sort of in the top third of oddities. So 17 types of eggs, um, uh, I could get this number a little bit off, so if any of you are farmers or own a farm, don't call me out. Um, roughly 14 of them have uh, basically a uh, five day period that the FDA will allow them, not the FDA, who's the food, food and drug, oh, yeah, FDA, uh, allows them on a refrigerated truck. And after five days, the truck driver, um, let's call him Mo, um, Mo has to go to the back of the truck and turn it from 22 degrees to 18 degrees. Now, if he doesn't do that, salmonella. So, stores like Heinen's, um, no way are they trusting Mo. Like, no. Jeff and Tom are not getting, like, not waking up and thinking to themselves, you know what? I'm sure Mo did it. <laughs> They're like, nope, six day, throw those eggs in the trash. It's just waste. It's just, it's just, that's just money lost. Three of the eggs can last for seven days. So a, a local company, it took, it took them two years, which is the, early, the nascent stages of blockchain, did something really neat. Um, they developed a system for a uh, East Coast grocer, and they said, based on the weather patterns coming up from uh, let's say like a hurricane or something, um, or a big storm that'll delay the trucks. Instead of you ordering the five day eggs, you'll pay a little bit more and order the seven day eggs because our trucks are probably gonna get caught in a storm somewhere. You don't have to worry about Mo. We're just, we got it. We're just gonna pay a little bit more for the eggs. No waste. So if the eggs show up on day six, go ahead and sell them. Salmonella cases went from 13 to zero in their, in, in their distribution channel. By the way, I mean, 13, you're on the verge of going out of business if you're that grocer, right? That's not, you're, you better hope that the press doesn't get ahead of that. Ahead of that. Um, so nonetheless, this is a great application of blockchain, was having a smart contract in place that based on weather, it kicked in an order that automatically went through for a different kind of egg that went on a truck because no one trusted Mo, get back to the trust issue. They had perfect transparency as to whether or not the right egg was ordered, the provenance of the egg, they knew it came from the right farm, they knew it got distributed, they knew it what day it showed up at the store, they had a track record, and at the end, FDA said anything about it, they just said, and here's our record. Yes? 
leading to the idea of integration of AI pattern recognition within this context? Yes. I assume that's in the future. Yes, so you asked about AI and the integration of that into this. AI and blockchain are like, uh, uh, what are the twins that don't look alike? What are, which, which one? Paternal. Paternal, right? <laughs> They're twins, they came out of the same room, at the same time, same mom, same dad, but they don't look alike. That's what blockchain and AI are. They are, they are so inextricably linked that the two uh, are constantly working together. The problem that you have, blockchain takes a lot of computing power and AI takes a lot of computing power. So uh, like on, and Bernie and I and our venture arm, um, a lot of the opportunities we look at are in the space of people who are trying to figure out how to get the computing power to a place where it can actually handle doing both together. So if you move to quantum. Yes, quantum will, well, uh, it'll, <laughs> That's, if blockchain is going to change a lot when quantum comes into play, uh, it's a it's a whole new uh, it's a whole new deal. I don't know if any of you've seen it. It ties into robotics as well. Um, so uh, if you get a chance, it's kind of fun. A little Google. Uh, there's uh, Disney made a uh, stuntman double. That's a robot. Uh, just Google it. It makes no sense what this robot can do. And what it's doing is it's very quickly processing its surroundings. At using AI, so there's no blockchain component here, but you'll see how it links in. It's very quickly processing everything around it using AI and reacting like a human would. So they like threw it 50 frisbees all over the place and it caught every single one. Um, and this is a robot, so a little spooky when you think about the robot that might come in and clean up the breakfast after we leave. That that is inevitable. Inevitable. It's just a matter of cost and, and time. So these are some examples. Um, I, I, for anyone that wants a list of examples um, and some content, I can send some things out uh, on email. Just give me your email, or I can send it to Tom or Rob, and I put together a little pre-made email that would make it easy in case you want to see some of these things. But these are some examples that I thought, again, might get the brain juices going. Um, this is the supply chain example. This is courtesy of Cisco. Uh, so I think we talked through this, so we don't need to spend too much time on it, because I sort of mapped out a couple of examples for the way that it, it gets impacted. By the way, the reason this has got the little uh, you know, error symbol next to it is that the distribution channel partner is one of the reasons why supply chain is so quickly adopting blockchain. Because the supplier trusted the manufacturer, the manufacturer basically trusts the shipping company, and nobody trusts the distribution channel partner. So they're trying to eradicate the use of that by having the customer automatically order with the manufacturer so that they know how much to buy from their supplier and then put it on the ship and then probably Amazon will get it to the customer. All right. Hey, Shane. Yes. Uh, are you gonna, there you go. That's yep. what I was just going to ask you. Yeah, yeah, so I'll give you a quick overview of Blockland. Who is familiar with Blockland? <coughs> Bottom, okay, reasonable amount of people. So the, the short story on this was um, uh, when Bernie and I were thinking about starting uh, Onum, which is the, the company that we build up for the government <coughs> products, um, the venture arm was separate, uh, people kept asking us, well, where are you going to put it? And he and I, I live in Gates Mills, he lives in Westlake, and we're like, I don't know, that's kind of an argument between the two of us. Independence? Downtown? I don't know. And they're like, no, 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 like Austin, New York, California. Just kind of looked, and he and I, are both of us are not from here. Um, this area has been wonderfully fantastic to both of our families, and so we felt that we wanted to do something here. So we said, no, we're going to do it here. And they're like, well, you can't build a tech company in Cleveland. And yeah, I am competitive, but I might be captain of the junior high JV when it comes to competitiveness. Bernie is like the captain of the varsity team and reigning all-time scoring champion. So he was like, the hell with that. We're going to do it here. And so uh, that's how Blockland basically got going, was just frustrated over this idea that you couldn't do it here. Of course you can, look at what we have. So these things tie into what block, <clears throat> why Blockland can be successful. Um, opportunity zones, if you're not familiar with them, basically under the new tax code, um, occasionally the government gets some things right in terms of development. What they did was they wrote in a way uh, so that every, um, if you have a capital gain, and you take that capital gain. So let's say you, you bought a uh, <clears throat> let's say you bought that bottle of wine for 15 grand and you sold it for 25 grand. Um, 
So you take that 25 grand, um, and really, you can, if you want, you can just take the 10 that you made the game. Take the 10 that you made, and you put it into buying a dilapidated building in some part of Cleveland that's that's been uh, mapped as it was called an opportunity zone. By the way, about 60% of Cleveland is an opportunity zone, both good and bad. Um, bad because that's not where you want to end up as a town. Good in that it's a fantastic opportunity to gather up these dollars from all over the country that are looking for these investments. So you take the 10,000, put it into a dilapidated building, the, and the building starts to generate income and have gains. Um, those gains uh, that you had on that first bottle of wine that you sold, that 10,000, you don't have to pay tax on for 10 years. So your taxes defer. So you were going to have to pay, give or take, three bucks or three thousand dollars, right? About thirty percent, just rounding. Um, now you don't have to pay that until ten years later. Also, let's say that dilapidated building. Let's say you put it and you uh, CSU expands and they buy the fifteen warehouses right near you, and all of a sudden your dilapidated building is worth a ton. Let's say it goes from ten thousand to a hundred thousand. That ninety thousand of gain, no tax ever. That's an opportunity zone. So you're coming out of a 10 year economic boom. People are sitting on tons. Boom is strong. Economic growth period. People are sitting on a lot of gains. Those gains are seeking a place to go. And what's really neat is they're seeking a place to go right away because there's an 18 month window from the gain until you deploy it where you have to get it out. You have to use it somewhere. So this is occurring, I, I, there's probably not a day that goes by that someone's not calling some part of the now close to 2,000 people are associated with Block Plan um, and asking about development opportunities. That's why, um, so talked about the vision, the goals a little bit, but uh, this, is, this is why this is so sort of intriguing. There are 10 nodes to Block Plan. So think of it as uh, Bernie and me and about 20 other people sitting around thinking, Okay, how do we create a civic effort that uh, you know, we'll lose money on every day of the week, but that's not the point, this is altruism. This isn't about, there's no self-serving premise here, except that hopefully we'll have more talent to hire into our tech company, this goes well. And um, how do we get people in all these different areas to come together and take it upon themselves to go and run with research and innovation, run with plates, run with thought leadership, and uh, that, ballooned out into now 2,000 people. So give or take, there's 10, there's 10 nodes, so give or take about 200 people per node. And everyone's running in their own direction. And then they come back, and about once a quarter, once a month, depending on the group, we get together, and uh, once a quarter as all 10, we get together, and everyone checks in on everyone else's progress. There's no public money, very limited government, and I think when this is all done, it'll be a really, neat book that gets written about how to truly do economic development in a private way. Um, and, and it's the most diverse movement I think we've ever seen in Cleveland based on the history I can read, again, I'm not from here. And the reason is, there was, this isn't old school, you know, old boys network Cleveland. This was anyone that wants to help can get involved, anyone. There's a barber from downtown who, who said, how can I help? And we said, well, can you take cryptocurrency? said, yeah. So he wound up getting articles written about him because he's a barber in downtown Cleveland taking cryptocurrency. And he said, well, how does this help? So you're getting the word out that Cleveland is cool when it comes to crypto. Uh, and so everyone can get involved. The, on the Facebook page and other places, you can see the demography. Um, it was hilarious. At one stage, somebody called and they said, well, we're really worried that uh, Blockland's not diverse enough. And I said, well, OK, you're calling the white guy, so fair enough. <laughs> Bernie's Hispanic, and if you look at everything on the Facebook page that tracks all the demography, um, this is the most diverse thing we've seen in Cleveland. It's, it's basically half women, it's 40% minorities, it's, it's a fantastic. And the, the neatest part about it was people came out of the woodwork. People we never knew existed in Cleveland were like, oh, I've been building a tech company for 10 years. I hop in a plane in Cleveland Hopkins all the time, and I fly to all these places, and I come back here because I love it here. How do we not know about your company? Oh, I've got 30 people down in Seoul. Oh, okay. That story kept happening 40, 50, 60 times. And these companies are now all coming together and saying, yeah, we can build this tech hub. So this is the concept of Blockland, is to continue to develop these things. Um, great, great partners along the way. One, a big win. Uh, if you are a Cleveland-based company, and Cleveland is uh, not defined by your zip code, but we're gonna count, we're gonna count uh, 
Seoul and Independence. We're gonna count everything as Cleveland. Just call it <laughs> Cleveland when you when you fill in the box. You can you can um, access the Blockchain Research Institute, which, if you're curious, is a really big deal because it's 150 grand to sign up for this if you're a company. I think you can get a discount to 100 grand if you ask really really nice. Every single company in Cleveland that is under a billion dollars in revenue has access to the BRI's database. So if you're curious, you leave here and you're curious about your your industry, um, you can go onto the block, it's blocklandcleveland.com and you can get to the Facebook page. And the Facebook page has the instructions for how to uh, access the Blockchain Research Institute. This is the foremost thought leader in blockchain research anywhere in the world, based in Toronto. Toronto is sort of the epicenter for thought around blockchain. Um, and uh, they partnered with Cleveland because they saw it as sort of their altruistic effort to get a way to help uh, a downtrodden uh, city economically, not, uh, you know, not from the standpoint of our morale or anything, but just economically. And uh, we had a few people that, and entities that donated some money and we were able to buy it and have access for all the companies in Cleveland. So it was a big deal. Um, and so I have some summaries here on each of the other, uh, each of the nodes. But rather than go into that, um, let me stop again and see what questions you might have. Yes? Um, my question has to do with information entering the blockchain in the first place. So if we go to your egg example, mm -hmm. the GA, uh, I understand how once the information is in the blockchain, it can be trusted. But how do you authenticate the information entering the blockchain in the first place? Yeah. So, um, so <clears throat> it's a great question, and it's solved in a myriad of ways depending on your product. Um, but uh, at, at some stage, if we go back to we go back to this example. So, it's not like the farmer has an IoT on every channel, right? <laughs> um, so you are at some stage trusting that the farmer split up the 14 types of eggs on one place and the three types on the other and did that correctly. And then, you, and then what might occur is as those pallets are loaded, you might introduce IoT or you might say to the farmer, you, uh, as you enter the data, um, if he's not entering the data, it could be somebody else entering the data or the farmer. Um, that data comes from a verified source. So you are saying, oh, I trust the farmer. I mean, at some stage you have to, you have to some, somebody's gonna do something, right? So you are choosing the supplier you trust, and you are saying, I trust that that person can access it. What can happen is the somebody that's not the farmer couldn't enter the data for the farmer, right? So the security around the identity of who's entering it you have a what's called a cryptographic hash, so an, an identification, as the farmer entering it, kind of like your password to get in, and that identifies that that is the person who entered it. So the way it's controlled is that you chose your supplier, and that supplier has an access point, but nobody else can get to that access point, and if they try, they hacked it, they tried to pretend to be the farmer, they wouldn't have the right cryptographic hash, and all the computers would say, that's the wrong hash. So that's how it gets controlled. It's a little bit technical, but it's identity management. Yes? Uh, our company's in the real estate business. All of real estate information is concentrated in multiple real estate services. Yep. Gary Keller, who owns Keller Williams, is really the largest in the company the country. He's spending a billion dollars to capture and aggregate that information. And of course, AI goes right with it. Sure. Do you think blockchain? So yeah, uh, no, it, it ties in. There's a company in Columbus called SafeChain that is uh, digitizing real estate titles and tax records. They right now they have a product called SafeWire that um, tracks the, the wires. Came. So there's a lot of wire. You, you know this. There's a ton of wire fraud and real estate transaction because, um, like I said, all databases have been hacked. So what people do that are mean. That if you're doing a real estate transaction, presume that they're reading your email and they determine uh, when you have a transaction and then 
they know when the closing date is, so they send you fraudulent wire instructions, and then you forward it to your attorney or your bank or whatever, and the wire gets money and before anybody figures it out, the money's gone. This happens like one out of every 13 transactions right now. It's actually reasonably high. Um, and it doesn't, you, you, you don't see it a lot when you're uh, like doing larger, or basically when you're wealthier, you don't see it because there's more protections put in place. Sadly, it occurs a lot um, in poor communities and all over the world. Uh, it's less of a US issue, more of a global issue. Um, so they protect wires using uh, blockchain. They're digitizing the, the title. That, um, that links directly into taking all those listings and being able to track it and the reduction of the bill money. So, yeah, well, it's a good. The, the input from the real estate business is the realtors. The realtors put this information in the MLS. So if you can control, he's got 190,000 good. Right. So if you can control the input, eliminate a lot of the issues that are come from that. You do. And I th what'll happen, it, at least the theory that I've seen in that space, was that uh, uh, people were looking at listing data and saying, this looks a little off, this looks a little errant. And you could have multiple sources that would have to agree that that listing would be valid. So you could have you know, the agent from uh, your entity and somebody from Howard Hanna and maybe somebody else would have to mutually agree for that to for that listing to occur. And the fact that they all agreed and they agreed that particular data would be tracked on the blockchain, uh, enabling someone to go back 20 years later and say, hey, the real estate agent sold me something that wasn't there. They said there was fifth better and there's only four. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. I got a couple of gifts for you. And Kat found this one for you. <laughs> That's great, thank you. It's the fluent blockchain. That's great, thank you. Oh, thank you. It's very nice of you. Thank you very much. Can you stay around for a few minutes? Yeah, sure. Sure thing. Be here. Uh, Hauserman, of course, you're the one who made us go against your rule and end at 8.59. Uh, thank you. Please remember February 20th for our normal February uh, meeting and then February 26th for a very special one. We'll be in contact with you. Very quickly, I'd like to thank Roz, Todd, Kat, our team here today, and see you all very shortly. Thank you.